You are watching a clip from the John Perry channel, Genetics and Evolution. Here, I have a juvenile chimpanzee. The top of the skull is very round and smooth. And here, I have a mature chimpanzee, and he has this beautiful sagittal crest on the top mm -hmm. that's just, you know, kind of like a bone mohawk. Yeah, and it totally then, is. In the gorilla, so the that's mm -hmm. just... <laughs> absolutely extreme, huge crest up here. And in both of these animals, in chimps and gorillas, that does not exist when they're young. In fact, I've got a, this here is a baby gorilla and his skull is shaped just like a human's actually. So oh, the, or, sorry, this is a, this one's a chimpanzee. I've got a gorilla over there. But this fact that bones are constantly changing shape is spectacular. Not all animals can do this. Is that correct? Uh, sort of. So not all animals can do a certain other type of remodeling. So we, we can get into it. Um, there's different kinds of remodeling. One called, one that most people think of, which actually causes most of the remodeling in our body, and it's called osteonal remodeling. And all that means is it's led by osteons. It's actually led by your blood vessels invading the bone and carrying cells with them that destroy and rebuild bone. We'll talk about that more in detail because that's the one that does a lot of heavy lifting in our skeleton. But the less known one, and that's what my publication was about, which is why I talk about it a little bit more often, is perilacunar remodeling, which is basically osteocytes, bone cells, live in these little caves, and they can remodel the cave that they live in. And the cave is obviously made of bone because they live in our bones and they monitor our bones and they, you know, check out if there's too much stress or not enough calcium. And if your bone needs remodeling, they're the ones that send out the alarm for, for these cells to come and do remodeling. But what they actually can do themselves is that they can take away uh, calcium and phosphate from the walls and recirculate it back into the system. And this is happening on a cellular scale. It's super, super tiny. So the, all they're doing is just etching the outside of their environment and sending that. But when you consider that aside from like neurons and other cell types, like osteocytes are the longest lived uh, and very numerous cells in our skeleton, uh, it does have an impact on your metabolism. So that's one type of remodeling. But this, the really interesting and, um, and the one that we can see very often is this osteonal remodeling, this type, which basically forms all these blood vessels coming through your bone and they carry with them at the very front of them, they carry osteoclasts. So that's how they bury through, uh, through the bone. They basically do these like mole tunnels through your bone. And then they send out osteoblasts on the outside and they rebuild. And that's how you end up remodeling old bones. So say you had an, an old wall, they tunnel through that old wall and then rebuild on their way out. And they do it in like a really interesting like zipper motion. So you're open it like it's open on one side and they start to close it off as they go along. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's how we, we basically get a new skeleton every seven to 10 years until you're like 25 or something along those lines. And it depends on the type of bone and it's just continuously recycling, continuously renewing. One of your questions is how do you get, you know, crests on one animal and not the other, or over uh, ontogeny as they're growing up. How, why yeah. are they getting crests? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's, let's talk about the crests first because it seems to be pressure from the muscles, the chewing muscles that causes the crest to grow. Because they start out when they're young, they have the muscles just on the side of the head. And as they go through puberty, those muscles enlarge and they creep up, they get so big, they creep up the skull. And it seems like somehow by pulling on the skull, that triggers the cells to be like, oh, we need to build more bone here. And that that process is just mysterious to me. We know our muscles have an influence on our bone. That's why, you know, if you work out, you get denser bones. If you go to space and you're not using your muscles against your bone as much, you get less dense bones. So we know that the two talk to each other. What you're looking at in that crest is a muscle attachment site. And it's known that muscle attachment sites will get more robust uh, based on pressure. So kind of like you said, it, it's, they're not exactly pushing up the bone and they're not exactly pulling at the bone. But what they're doing is, even if you have like the tiniest little crest, 
and you have a little bit of muscle that's attached to it as it's being, as the muscle is working, you know, flexing and loosening up and flexing and loosening up, it actually puts pressure on the periosteum there, the thin layer that covers all our bones and has the living cells in it. And that tells the bone, hey, this is an important spot. Make it bigger, make it rougher so we can attach more things. So that's how you get some of those crazy crests on those primates. But it's also how you get really intense attachment sites on arms and legs and stuff in fossils. And that's how we reconstruct muscular, the musculature of extinct animals. We follow these rugus areas, these areas that are bumpy and lumpy. And that's how we know, okay, this is bumpy and lumpy because a muscle pulled on it a whole lot. So now we know that that must connect to something here and that must connect to something here. So that's, it's a good question because muscle attachment sites are incredibly important. Yeah. If you were looking at a human skeleton, could you tell if the person was a weightlifter versus, you know, regular Joe? Would that, would that um, actually show up? It would. It definitely yeah. would. Would I be able to tell? You probably want to talk to a, um, like, anthropologist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. just because I'm not as familiar with human anatomy. But yes, you definitely can. There's even papers that they look at skeletons of, like, people from medieval times and look at the robustness of the ephemera, the, the leg bones, and how mm-hmm. thick the cortical bone is. And they can tell, okay, this person was, you know, working hard labor. Uh, And that, you know, corresponds with the type of burial we found them in. And that kind of stuff does show up in your bones. Our skeletons record our lives. I read a paper a long time ago, years ago. Uh, They found a broken bone that had healed on a human. And there was a certain structure in the face that made it look like for years they had this painful wincing expression on their face that could actually show it actually showed up in the bones when someone ha- is in pain, they move their face in a certain way and that can that tugs on the bone a little bit. And they said they can actually read that in the face. I don't know how um, like disputed that claim is, but they, they're like, oh, yeah, this person was in misery their whole life. Isn't that awesome? Oh, God. <laughs> but, but... <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, that's uh, that's ancient osteology for you. I kind of say the same thing a lot about animals. I'm like, oh, look at this pathology. I found. It's so cool. This animal limped its whole life. <laughs> yeah. And then you realize you're like, mm, not the nicest thing. But um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know about that particular paper, especially because in the face, the human face, a lot of the muscles are so fine and yeah. they're smooth muscles. It's like a, they're not these like strong tugging muscles. I really wonder if they would make that kind of impact on osteology, but I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out. I'd have to read the paper. But that sounds yeah. really cool. So after my conversation with Yara, I looked this up. It turns out that I did not read about this in a paper. I watched it in a Nova documentary on PBS, and scientists do not agree. You can't actually tell someone's facial expressions, unfortunately, based on their skull. But in the Nova special, they did think you could, and they said this. They say, in the case of Kennewick Man, evidence for severe injuries suggested that the man lived many of his 40-plus years in frequent, if not chronic, pain. He had a bunch of broken bones. He had indications that he got stabbed with a spear, all sorts of stuff. Prominent muscle markings above the chin and beneath the eye sockets confirmed this, revealing a face held in an expression of determined endurance. For this reason, our approximation shows the weariness of a middle-aged man in perpetual discomfort. That's a pretty cool sculpture. But their claim is contradicted by this paper, Facial Reconstruction, Anatomical Art or Artistic Anatomy which goes over the what we can and cannot trust in these facial reconstructions. These are really cool, by the way. It's pretty impressive what can be done. But you cannot get enough detail to figure out what type of facial expression a person was making during their life. So here we have this huge, on the top of the skull here, we've got this huge crest, which... So what you're saying is that this, it's the, it's the tissue on the outside of the bone that is getting that signal and is trying to grow in accommodation to that. Well, that's it for this clip, but don't worry. I post clips regularly and every Thursday I post completely fresh content. Make sure you're subscribed. Liking and commenting is also welcome.